Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the very first episode of The King's Bodyguard with your host, Dave Hebler. Grandmaster Hebler is a 10th degree Grandmaster Black Belt in the art of Kempo Karate under the tutelage of the American father of Kempo Karate, originally Ed Parker Sr. Dave was the personal martial arts instructor and bodyguard of the King of Rock and Roll, Elvis Presley, from 1972 to 1976. I'm going to read you a very brief bio on Dave Hebler so you can be acquainted with the man who is Dave Hebler. So Dave Hebler has been sought after self-defense instructor for over 60 years. Hence the reason why the world's greatest entertainer, Elvis Presley, chose Dave to be one of his bodyguards and the personal entourage that Elvis had known as the Memphis Mafia from 1972 to 1976. Dave became an integral part of Elvis's life after the two met at Ed Parker's American Kempo Karate Studio in Pasadena, California. Later, Dave became Elvis's personal Kempo instructor for several years. Besides being known as one of the Memphis Mafia members and Elvis's bodyguard, Dave has a 10th degree black belt in Kempo Karate. One of the true pioneers of American Kempo Karate, Dave began his martial arts journey under the late senior grandmaster and founder of American Kempo Karate, Ed Parker, in 1959. Dave is a member of three Hall of Fame, Master Hall of Fame in 2010, Kempo Karate Hall of Fame in 2016, and Hall of Fame South America Martial Arts in 2018. Dave travels the world not only speaking about his years with Elvis, but is also a four-time author gives lectures and workshops on self-defense and assault prevention. When not traveling, Dave resides in Wichita Falls, Texas. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Dave Hebler. Hello, Tim. Thank you for the introduction. And hello, everybody. Good to be with you. I so first, Tim first Dave, if you get asked about all the and we discussed this, is what this person was really like. Yeah, I'll give you a little bit of a, um, of a background first, and, and then I'll, I'll answer that question, if you don't mind. Um, Absolutely. Uh, I think it's kind of relevant because, like Elvis, uh, I was a poor boy. Uh, I was raised in a, uh, along with my four brothers and my mom and dad, uh, in a uh, four and a half room apartment in a tenement building that uh, we like to joke about uh, saying that it was uh, built in 1890 and condemned in 1891. Nevertheless, the apartment, um, was four and a half rooms and one bathroom for all seven of us, my poor mother. But in any event, um, we didn't have an, uh, we, uh, we had one bathroom and uh, we didn't have any hot water. Uh, any, any water that needed to be heated had to be heated on this, this old, iron oil driven stove in the kitchen um we didn't have a car we didn't have a tv we didn't have a phone but we did have rats and cockroaches <laughs> and i gotta tell you <laughs> you have never lived until you've had a cockroach or a rat run across your face while you're sleeping. Fun times. <laughs> Anyhow, that's a short background. Um, the uh, number one question that I have received over the years, and as you can imagine, I've received thousands of them, is what was Elvis Presley, the person, really like? This is... Um, it's a really hard question, if you think about it. How do you answer a question like that? So I thought about it, and I thought about it, and I 
finally came up with what I thought might be a pretty good uh, uh, answer to that question. And um, so I, uh, I seized on a topic that uh, everybody already, already knows about. I, I mean, you all know about the fact that Elvis Presley was a very generous human being. And that's true. He was. He was the most gen generous human being that I've ever met. I mean, he bought houses and furniture and cars and trucks and motorcycles and go-karts and money and clothing and jewelry. Um, and he gave that all away uh, with a good heart. All he ever wanted in return was a thank you. So I thought it would be interesting for folks to get an appreciation of what it was like to be on the receiving end of all that generosity. And boy, was I on the receiving end. Driving around Memphis one day, I don't remember who was driving the car, but Elvis was in the, um, in the front seat, passenger seat. And I was in the back seat behind the driver, and we're just driving around, having a good time, talking about this, that, and the other thing, telling jokes, talking about girls, just enjoying each other's company. And all of a sudden, Elvis says to me, hey, Dave, I want to buy you a car. I said, oh, well, that's nice, Elvis, but you don't have to do that. He said, yeah, no, I don't have to do that, but I want to buy you a car. I said, well, Elvis, you just gave me a Mercedes a year and a half ago. You don't have to give me a car. He said, I know I don't have to give you a car, but I want to give you a car. I said, well, yeah, well, don't feel like you have to. And the next thing I know, he had turned around and there's a gun, a loaded gun, stuck in my face. <laughs> I'm a, whoa. And Elvis said, you're going to take this blankety blank car or I'm going to blow your blankety blank head off. I said, whoa, whoa Elvis. <laughs> okay, okay. I'll take the car. Man, I didn't know you were serious. The car turned out to be a 1974 Lincoln Continental with all the goodies all over it. And there's a lot of stories about that car, which I won't get into, but I will tell you that that car today is on display at Graceland. It's the purple Lincoln. So when you go there and you see the Lincoln, say hi for me. At any event, a couple of months later, Elvis and I are sitting in his, uh, we're in his bedroom, actually, sitting on his bed, the edge of his bed, and we're just talking. And I, for some reason, I don't know, I just said, hey, Elvis, have you got any idea of how many vehicles you have bought and given away in the last two years? And he said, nah. And I don't care either. He says, hang on, I want to show you something. <clears throat> Goes away, comes back, hands me a check. Made out to him in the amount of $100,000. One of a series of checks, many before, many more to come. And he said, you know, I'm not stupid. I understand that I couldn't possibly buy the kind of goodwill and PR that I get whenever I buy somebody a car. And so secondly, it seems like every time I do something like that, I buy somebody a car, it comes back to me 10 times over. 
like that check you're hearing. And thirdly, it makes me feel good to make people happy. Ladies and gentlemen, Elvis Presley, the person. I think it's really interesting too for people to know what type of individual it took to be the king of rock and roll's bar. So your background, but what I know of your background is that you grew up and you became enlisted in the military and you heard some guys talking about martial arts with you and that inspired you to take the path of learning self-defense and becoming a martial artist. Um, my question to you is, were you always interested in learning how to defend yourself or for the people to know like what inspired you to actually take the path of being the martial artist? Hmm. Okay. It's a little bit of a long story. I'll try to keep it as short as I can. Um, I was uh, in the Air Force in 1958, stationed at March Air, March Air Force Base in Southern California outside of Riverside, California. And there were a, um, a number of um, Hawaiian guys in my squadron who were out practicing doing something that they called Kenpo. And um, I was kind of fascinated by it all. And um, so they, they asked me if I'd be interested in joining them in their workouts. I said, yeah, heck yeah, I'd like to do that. So I did. And um, I found it to be a lot of fun. And I also found out later on that they really didn't know a whole lot about Kempo, but that's okay. <clears throat> they, know, they knew that I was getting out of the Air Force the following year in 1959, and I was going to enroll in college at Pasadena City College in Pasadena, California. And in order for me to do that, I had to get um, an early out from the Air Force so I could join my college classes uh, in September when they actually started. So uh, I had to enroll by June 1 of 1959. So my Hawaiian friend says, uh, to say to me, well, look, uh, if you're going to enroll in uh, college, he said, when you're, when you're done with your enrollment, drive up the street about two, two blocks, and uh, there you'll find Ed Parker's um, Kempo Karate School. And um, go see him, because when it comes to Kempo, he's the man. He is the greatest there is. So I did exactly that. I drove in, I registered at college, I drove up the two blocks, and there's Ed Parker School. Uh, I parked, went into school. The only person there was Ed Parker. So we started, um, we started talking, and I told him a little bit about my, uh, my background, and, um, uh, and he, um, he and I chatted for a bit, and then he, uh, he brought me out on the mats. And... Um, to show me a little bit of his version of Kempo Karate. And I was astounded. I mean, it was like the building got hit by lightning. You know, the, the ground shook. And I have never seen a human being that could move like that man. His speed and power was just awesome. And I knew right then and there, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to try to learn to move like him. So I signed up for classes right then and there. And then um, two days later, I had my first class. I drove from March Air Force Base to Pasadena, which is 60 miles. And um, um, 
I got all dressed up and I'm uh, I'm kind of anxious, so I got there uh, quite a bit early. And um, uh, standing there was this uh, was this uh, this guy, this instructor guy, his name was Jimmy Ibrow, and he introduced himself and uh, he said, "Well, I'm going to be your instructor, so we got some time before the class. Come on out here." And let me see what you got. What? <laughs> no, you know, I stepped out in the bed and he said, uh, yeah, come on, show me what you got. And I said, what do you mean? He said, throw some uh, punches and kicks at me. And I said, uh, like, for real? And he said, yeah, for real. So I, you know, very clumsily, you know, attacked him. And the next thing I know, I'm flat on my back, looking up at him, and he's looking down at me, and he said, I don't ever want to let, want, want that to happen to you ever again. And I said, I couldn't agree more. And that was the start of my martial arts career. How long did it take you to be confident in the arts to know that you had the capability to be able to defend yourself? Oh, uh, it took me um, um, a year, maybe a year and a half. Uh, you know, I only weighed 55 pounds at the time. I didn't scare anybody. So, but I did have one attribute that worked for me and it's still working to me for me today is that I had a lot of speed. I really was fast. And that's a, that's a big help when you don't, if you don't weigh 300 pounds, you better darn well be fast. Mm -hmm. And that's when, I, that's when I learned that. You know, I felt I was tested and I, for the most part, received passing grades. And, uh, you know, the training in those days was not easy. I mean, um, they called it the dungeon dojo, and they called it that for, uh, for a reason, <laughs> because it was pretty brutal. You know, uh, we didn't have any protective gear of any kind. You know, we just flat out, um, you know, spent a ton of time doing basics and conditioning and sparring. Lots and lots of sparring. And the, that regimen, uh, you know, gave me the um, self-confidence to know mm -hmm. that I was capable. And basically, that was it. So from that curriculum that martial arts taught you, how would you differentiate the training you had in the military to the training you had in the martial arts? Oh, I, in the military, I was a uh, intelligence operations specialist. Um, I didn't have any training physically, <laughs> to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, the uh, other than my. Uh, going to the gym on a regular basis. Uh, I had no, no training from, uh, from the Air Force physically. So you became competent pretty quickly when you had the people around you who were teaching you and it took you about a year and a half before you found out you could really defend yourself so when you walked out on the street, did you have a new sense of confidence that martial arts built within you to know that, hey, I've, what I've learned, I can use these practices and adapt them to pretty much any situation I'm in? Yeah. That, I mean, you, you said it right there, Tim. Uh, you got, when, you're, when you've been tested and you get passing grades, you can't help but get uh, a sense of self-confidence confidence uh, in your own ability to be able to stand on your own two feet and function successfully. Mm -hmm. And incidentally, that carries over into every aspect of your life. That's the good part of the training. 
So back then, compared to today's practices and standards, let's call them, of martial arts training, how would you liken the world today of martial arts training to the world of your era of martial arts training? But I feel today that martial arts is watered down and students are given belts before they're ready to pass to the next grade or pass to the next rank, as it were. Um, but nowadays, it's a lot of pay for rank. Well, we're on break right now. Jimmy, I got to take a dump. What? No. I mean, I need a dumpster. <sighs> well, for all those needs, you need to call Big V Dumpster Rental. Long Island, New York, 631-900-DUMP. Hmm. And Nitro's Garage for all your automotive needs. Call 646-675-2349. That's 646-675-2349. For all your automotive needs, Nitro's Garage. Ask for Jack. And ladies and gentlemen, we are back with episode one of the King's Bodyguard with your host, Mr. Dave Hebler, talking about the ethics morals and practices of today's martial arts training compared to his era. So to give the audience a brighter view of what it was like to go through the ranking to be a black belt in your era, you had to go through blood, sweat, and tears and a lot of potentially broken bones. Hopefully not, but I know the training back then was a lot more hardcore than it is today. What is your opinion on that? Yeah, generally speaking, I think that uh, you're probably correct. There are many schools today who, uh, you got to understand today is a litigious society, boy. You got to be, you got to be so careful. Uh, if you're operating a school and somebody gets injured in, um, in the training, you're liable, you know, I mean, to lose everything that you own. So as a result, a lot of folks that, that, that run schools are, are very careful about um, the intensity of the training. But in spite of that, I know plenty of people who are pretty much hardcore, basically fundamentally great martial artists and great instructors who turn out great and competent pe and competent people. So um, in some ways, uh, it's alive and well, and in other ways, not so much. Well, you guys sparred back then in your era when you first started, I mean. There was basically no rules as far as no holes barred. I mean, it was, like you just said earlier, no protective gear. So that had to have given you a lot more realistic feel to what it was like to be in combat compared to today where everything is protected with padding and there's not a real sense of what real contact feels like. Well, maybe I can give you an idea with a story. Um, mm -hmm. You know, in those days, back in those days, we didn't have any children. There were no kids. And we didn't have any women. Well, there was this one woman. Her name was Ruby. And the first time I saw Ruby, she was in her, she was in action sparring with one of the guys in the advanced class. And uh, all of a sudden, Ruby throws this wicked back knuckle smacks this guy across the eyebrow and it's instant gash, instant buckets of blood, instant trip to the ER and instant six stitches to cover that, you know, to <laughs> close up that, uh, that gash that she had delivered. Uh, 
And we were, all of us, not only were we impressed, uh, we were a little scared because we know our turn was coming sooner or later. And in those days, you didn't fight a woman. You didn't hit a woman. Okay? Mm -hmm. But the intensity of the day, and, and by the way, there was no gear of any kind. Um, we used to tape up our hands, you know, put tape on it, but that's not, that wasn't to, uh, you know, protect your face. So it's a, it's a, it's different. it's a little of this and a little of that today. I mean, I know some uh, I know some uh, instructors that uh, um, will turn out uh, that do will turn out amazingly competent. Um, uh, fighters, if you will. I mean, Dave Prosser comes to mind, uh, AC Rainey, uh, Trevor Sherman. Um, and uh, what's good in the martial arts today is uh, we have received uh, an influx of, of good material from different sources from all over the world. I mean, uh, wouldn't it be good to uh, Complement your kempo with uh, some um, jujitsu, or how about some ground fighting? Add it to the mix. I mean, that can only help you get a little bit better, right? Or at least I think absolutely. So. Well, one million percent, and that's what the ingredient that you just gave is the success of martial arts fighters, mixed martial arts fighters today. To be a success in mixed martial arts, you have to have cross-trained in several different styles. And instead of being pigeonholed and learning just one style, like I'm a martial artist myself and I've learned different styles through the years. I've cross-trained in eight different styles. That was gonna be my, my next question to you is, how do you feel practically a martial artist gets better and that is by learning other styles and by fighting other people from other styles. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I do. I mean, Kempo is a great style, but we don't have all the answers. We mm -hmm. don't. So, so some of the techniques that you learned in Kempo Karate, for example, you perfected them, but then you also created your own style and your own style was derived partly of Kempo, but also to let the audience know what the name of your style is and what ingredients were brought in to create your own style. Um, it's, a, it's called Pro Hebler Fighting Systems. And it's a, it's a combination of, of Kempo and uh, boxing. Uh, I'm a... Uh, I'm a big fan of boxers. I'm a big fan of wrestlers. Uh, I mean, I grew. I'm. I knew Rocky Marciano. Okay, <laughs> I go back uh, admiring um, the uh, the boxing world, uh, uh, and I still do to this day. So, in to the extent that you can you can gain some skills from these uh, amazingly world-class uh, athletes and um, um, practitioners do it. Boy, you see, a mo you see a good move there, steal it. Heck yeah, that's what I do. I mean, I see a good move. I don't care what the style is. I don't care what the system is. I see a good move. You know, I want to steal that. So give the fans a insight on an average day of being a bodyguard. And um, because here's the thing about it with Mike Tyson, I don't know if you saw this, he was on a main and band behind and he threw a bottle of water at his head and hit him and Mike Tyson turned and started throwing this on the guy and which opens up the star for a lawsuit. The, in my opinion, bodyguard, I take the star from the bar. It's oh, I, I, it's to the star from the fan. 
enter into that inner circle to where they, they can come a star and a star has to in a certain way and them potentially also. Tim, I'm sorry, you're just totally breaking up. Um, audio, the, the audio is really, really broken up bad. Um, uh, you want to get a, uh, an idea of what it was like to be a bodyguard? Yes. Uh, okay. Well, uh, all I can do is uh, give you my experiences of being a bodyguard with Elvis Presley. Mm -hmm. Elvis Presley was hugely popular. And everywhere he went, he drew large crowds of people. I mean, and right now. Uh, it's like they materialized out of the, you know, out of somewhere. I don't know. I don't know where they came from. I'll give you an idea. One time we stopped. We were driving that uh, that yellow Pantera. And we stopped at a gas station to uh, get some gas. And while I'm attending to that, Elvis gets out of the car. And we are immediately surrounded by, I don't know, 20, 30 people. And they just kept coming. I don't know where they were coming from. And here we are in the middle of all these people. And the only security for Elvis was me. I mean, that's it. And all those people. But Elvis... Um, was the was the most charming guy on the face of the planet. I mean, he didn't uh, he he loved his fans. I mean, really loved his fans, and he had the patience, uh, you know, beyond belief, with them. So he was always, um, uh, you know, greet them. He would always speak with them, uh, and he always wanted to do. Uh, on stage, the very, very best job that he possibly could be. I mean, everywhere we went, there were hundreds of love-starved women just doing their best to try to get next to uh, Elvis and love him to death. And it was my job to keep him from doing that. What a tough job for a guy, huh? I mean... <laughs> I often had to sacrifice my own body just to save him. What a horrible job for a guy, huh? <laughs> so you worked with Ed Parker for how many years to get your black belt? Oh, I got my black belt in um, two and a half years, two, uh, between two and a half and three years. I was with him um, pretty much for about 20 years. So in correlation from the time you met him to the time you got your black belt, uh, the story that I've told is that he was at, and you correct me, he was asked to go on the road initially, and he told Elvis he couldn't because he had martial arts schools to run. How long did it take, or what was the process involved in Ed Parker telling Elvis, hey, I can't go on the road with you, but I know the perfect person that can, and his name's Dave Hebler. How long did it take Parker to have that money in you to where he turned you on to Elvis as his bodyguard? Well, it uh, it didn't happen quite that way. It was a little bit different. Um I was uh, sitting in my uh, my karate school in uh, Glendora, California, and I get a call from a friend of mine, George Wade, informing me that this coming Friday, um, he and a bunch of the a uh, bunch of other black belts were getting together for a workout in Santa Monica at Ed Parker School there, and uh, he invited me to come down and join them in the workout. I hadn't seen these guys in quite a while, so I thought, well, yeah, great, I'll go. So I did. I drove the three hours it took me to get <laughs> from Glendora to uh, Santa Monica. And sure enough, the guys are there, so I suited up. We got out on the mats, and we're just having a good time working out. 
and uh, I, I noticed a commotion at the door. And in walked Ed Parker, and oh my God, Elvis Presley. And I thought, what's he doing here? Anyhow, Elvis is over there watching us work out as we're continuing with our workout. And uh, next thing I know, he's out on the mats wanting to work out with us. And I'm his training partner, his dummy. And um, I realized uh, right away that Elvis was not familiar with the uh, material that we were actually working with at the time. So I guided him through all of the process. I helped him, uh, you know, with the movements. We did some sparring. You know, I showed him how to uh, how to referee and and uh, call points and stuff. And and we had a uh, just a really a, a good time. It turned out really really well. So after the workout, um, Elvis and uh, Ed Parker are talking by the side of the ring, and um, uh, Ed calls me over, and we're, I'm chatting with him and and Elvis. And I used to do a technique in that day, in those days, um, that consisted of 13 different strikes, and then. In those days, I could do those 13 moves in about two seconds. Uh, today, it takes me two minutes, but <laughs> back then. And uh, every time I did that, people would go, wow. You know, so we named it that. That was the name of their technique, wowie. Well, I did that for, uh, for Elvis. And I learned later on that he was so impressed with that particular technique that uh, he, he right then and there decided that he wanted to have me as part of his entourage. And Ed Parker was all for that because Ed Parker was not available to go take a job somewhere on a full-time basis. I mean, he has schools to run and a family to feed. So, uh, um, and I would be uh, his representative you know, in the uh, in the Elvis world, and that basically, um, uh, you know, was true. You did, and I've never before. Have ever any experience with Chuck Norris? And in your opinion, what? How did Chuck Norris rank as a fighter in those days? Formative days. There. He was, a, he was a point fighter. He was never a full contact fighter from what I know. But where would you rank him over as a fighter? Chuck Norris? Oh, oh mm -hmm. he's one of the best. One of the best. No no okay. two ways about it. Oh, a great fighter. Uh, I, 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 I can't tell you how impressed I am and have been all these years with uh, Chuck Norris and his fighting skills. He's a good one. Mm -hmm. So in those days, of course, everybody knows, like they had a whole martial arts craze, martial arts movies, martial arts dojos. Like back then, before mixed martial arts, it was whose dojo is better than the other dojo? And other martial artists sometimes, from stories I've heard, would walk into other instructors' schools and challenge them to fight. Did any of that ever occur with Ed Parker's schools at all, or have you guys ever had any type of uh, experiences like that? Yeah, we did, but it was pretty rare. It didn't happen mm -hmm. an awful lot. Uh, you got to remember, back in those days, uh, really as brutal as the training was and the workouts was, sparring was really not a blood sport. We weren't out to try to hurt each other. Uh, the whole idea was to learn to develop tremendous control at full speed and full power. Going up against somebody who just might be a whole lot better than you are. And the good part about that is that if you're going to spar with somebody, spar with somebody better than you are. 
Then you'll learn. <laughs> then you'll learn real quick. Um, near death experiences or experiences that caught you off guard as a bodyguard or because of your martial arts training, you were always in everything around your surroundings. Um, you happen? Um, no, I was, uh, I was surprised on uh, a number of occasions. Um, mm -hmm. The, um, but not shockingly so. Uh, it, it, you never know what's going to happen when you're out uh, and about and uh, there's a crowd of people around. You don't know who's going to do what at any given time. And people are spontaneous. Uh, and things happen in an eye blink. And um, mm -hmm. so you better be uh, trained well enough to be able to ra react and react quickly um, in a, um, uh, you know, I'm searching for the right word because you can't violently strike out at someone, you know, making a move because you mm -hmm. don't know really what that person's intentions are. And to instantly go to death on wheels uh, is not a good way to operate. Unless you're forced to, of course, unless you're forced into a corner where you have no other alternative. There you go. Mm hmm. That's exactly mm -hmm. what I was going to say. What would you do? And if you APB, had American Protection Bureau, voted number one best on Long Island for all your security needs. Call 631-390-9050. That's 631-390-9050. APB. <laughs> oh, what's up, Mike? Hey, Jimmy, what's going on? Yeah, not that much. You know, Jimmy, I love this country. Oh. I love to buy Made in America material. And I love to buy my artwork at TAG, T-A-A-G, Made in America, 14 East Broadway, Port Jefferson, New York, 11717, the shop at the corner. Tired of that same old, same old breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Same old tasting scrambled eggs, burger, that dinner steak, ribs, or pork chops. Why not add a little bit of spice or just a touch of heat to make the difference? Change that scrambled egg with a little bit of Johnny Fabulous's John Cena Sr.'s Million Dollar Jalapeno Hot Sauce. Great on burgers, steaks, chops, and those barbecued ribs. Episode one of the King's Bodyguard. So I was asking you, Mr. Hebler, is uh, asking if you ever had a situation. I know this was part of my black testing where you had on several opponents at one time to see how you would react in that environment. But did you ever have... Uh, uh, a situation in real life had multiple attackers, and if so, how did you how did you combat that situation? Um, I uh, as I can call the only incident uh, that I can really remember uh, that I can remember when I was uh, when I was working for Elvis was a uh, an altercation with. Uh, two individuals. Um, mm -hmm. Real quick, uh, Dick Grove and I, um, uh, after the show, we, uh, we went down to the, uh, to the bar and um, in the hotel and we're having a beer. Uh, and there were a, a couple of guys that were, uh, you know, like snickering at us cause they knew who we were. And, um, <clears throat> Dick on down to uh, go to the bathroom, and I noticed that these uh, these uh, t 
two uh, loudmouths got up and they followed him into the bathroom and I knew this was uh, not not good <laughs> so I walk mm -hmm. in and sure enough there's this one guy one of the two is um, you know saying some uh, some garbage to uh, to dick and I knew it was going to be uh, mm -hmm. something so I just um, I just swept this guy out you know with his uh, in a knee and then just you know slammed him forward into the uh, into the basin uh, the wash basin in the in the bathroom and then just turned around and looked at the second guy and uh, they declined to continue the altercation and that was the end of it okay was that also part of your black belt testing like what consisted when i'm sure your training was much different because it was the, the traditional aspect of Kempo Karate in the beginning of Kempo Karate. What did you have to endure to go through to test for your first black belt? What was the curriculum? Oh, the curriculum? Well, uh, <laughs> yeah, let me simplify this. It was basics, basics, basics. Conditioning, conditioning, conditioning adversarial um, um, workouts against a willing partner, adversarial workouts against a non-willing partner, lots of sparring, lots of sparring, lots of sparring. That basically would, uh, uh, was it. Uh, we often mm -hmm. sparred with more than one opponent. And uh, if you're in a class of black belts and you're trying to fight two or three of those guys all at the same time, you know, you got to remember they're all trained as well as you are and maybe even better. I mean, that's mm -hmm. a chore to get away with a whole skin. So anyhow, that's, uh, that was the, uh, that, that was in rough, rough terms. Um, how we trained, you know, back in those days. So, I mean, as far as um, technique wise, movement wise, always, I know I learned from my training, always follow the person and their movements of their body. Example, and their hand goes in their pocket, your hand and what that comes out of their pocket with. I mean, were you, always aware of your surroundings when you were bodyguarding Elvis? Were you watching from the stage, off the stage, watching people, their movement, to see if anybody would come at Elvis, for example, with a weapon? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, mm -hmm. we were always alert to that. And, um, um, you know, I had, I wasn't all alone. You know, I had read Sonny and Dick. And, um, you know, some of the other guys in the entourage would act sometimes as bodyguards when we were on the, uh, on the road or at a concert. So we had a lot of help. And in addition to that, whenever we went on tour, we used to hire three or four uh, police officers to help us with the uh, security for a number of reasons. One, they knew uh, where everything was in the whole town. Uh, they, uh, uh, and they also had arrest powers, you know, which was always handy to have. So the, uh, we were well uh, equipped to handle um, just about any situation that uh, would come up. And, uh, and we did. Mm -hmm. Talk about the first time, well, you talked about the first time you met at Ed Parker's Dojo in Pasadena, California, but talk about when you actually were called by Ed Parker and you met Elvis in person for the first time outside of the dojo. What was that experience like? Yeah, after the uh, first occasion uh, at Ed Parker School, um, I got a call from Ed Parker, I think, the next day it may have been two days but i think the next day and he said elvis wants to uh wants us 
you and I to go out to his um, to his house in uh, Beverly Hills, and uh, you know have a social visit. And I said, Nah, I don't want to do that. <laughs> no, I lied. I, I didn't say that. <laughs> I said, Yeah, well, well, of course, yeah, let's go. So we did, and. Uh, so we got to the house and uh, we went in and we went, there weren't too many people there. Uh, Sonny was there and um, uh, some of the folks that worked there and um, a few other guys. And all we're doing basically is uh, sitting around and laughing and joking and getting to know one another. And after about, I don't know, 45 minutes or an hour, Elvis said to me, Dave, um, we have something to uh, that we need to take care of out in the driveway. So uh, if you'll excuse us for a bit, um, um, we'll go take care of that, uh, take care of that business. So they leave and I'm sitting there just looking around, you know, you know I don't know what's going on. And um, before long, I hear Elvis going, Hey, Dave, Come on out here, I need your help. Well, I don't know what he what he means. Is there, a, you know, some kind of a problem or something? I don't I don't understand. Anyway, so I go out. And there's everybody out there standing uh, around a uh, a beautiful little uh, Mercedes uh, 71 Mercedes uh, 280 SL. Beautiful car. I said, yeah, all this, uh, you know, uh, what can I help you with? And he said, it's this car. I said, yeah. He said, well, it's, 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 drive, it's cluttering up my driveway, and I want you to drive it away. I said, okay, where do you want me to drive it to? He said, anywhere you want. It's your car. And he handed me the keys and the paperwork. And I am astounded. I'm, you know, floundering around trying to find, you know, enough words of gratitude, you know, you know, beyond just thank you. And I don't know, you know, I, whatever. Anyhow, Elvis just laughed, said, enjoy your car, Dave. And they all walked in back in the house and Ed Parker, and I drove our respective vehicles away. That was my <laughs> that was my second meeting with Elvis. He gives me a car. That was the same meeting he gave you a TCB ring and a TCB necklace, I do believe. Was he? Did he no, say anything had, to you before he did that? No, that happened. Um, he um, he came out to my uh, karate school. And mm -hmm. uh, he went Sonny, actually. And, um, uh, of course, you know, I have my daughters there and um, um, have my guys out there that are working out on the mats. And um, I have my daughters there as well, Lori and Chris. <clears throat> and um, to make a long story short, Elvis is wearing a turban. And there you are. I think you're looking at the picture of Elvis with my daughters. On, on, uh, on the left is Chris, and on the right, as you're looking at the picture, is Lori. And Elvis wearing that turban. So everybody is wondering, you know, what's up with the turban? And uh, I wondered about that too. So I asked him. I said Elvis. Why are you wearing that turban? <laughs> and he said, well, you know, as we were leaving the house, you know, to come out and visit you, he said, I, I noticed that my hair looked like garbage. <laughs> he didn't say garbage. He said another word. But <laughs> he said, uh, my hair looked like garbage. He said, I didn't want to go out in public with my hair looking like that. So I grabbed this turban and slapped it on my head. And here we are. Well, isn't that what isn't that what you do when your hair looks like garbage? I know I know I do. I I always put a turban on when 
my hair looks like garbage. <laughs> Only elbows could get away with that kind of thing. But anyhow, that picture is, for obvious reasons, my favorite picture. So uh, that was the occasion where he gave me the tasty bean necklace and asked me to become one of his bodyguards on a full, you know, basically part-time, full-time basis. Well, how long was it before the time he gave you the TCB ring and the bead necklace wanted you to be his? Was it that you full road to tour? To, uh, from my understanding, you bodyguarded him in, in Memphis, Tennessee, and on the road on tour. Was, would that be correct to say? Yeah, we um, <clears throat> when, um, when Elvis was uh, in Memphis, um, we used to switch off um, bodyguard duties. Uh, two of us mm -hmm. would, uh, like uh, Red and Sonny, who lived in Memphis, they would uh, they would take the time off and uh, be with their family, and uh, me and Dick would be uh, we'd be there running the uh, doing the bodyguard jobs uh, uh, while we're just not on tour, and we switched off like that uh, back and forth. When the uh, when we were on tour, of course, we all we all worked. Everybody worked. This is the important of lineage from what you came from. from poker, Parker had to be just in full time bodyguard. What in the original origin of Ed Parker bringing the style Kempo Karate from Hawaii to the States. Where are you, where were you positionally in the original lineage of his black belts? Well, it's a, uh, it's a little bit murky. Uh, mm -hmm. there are some people who, um, uh, believe that I was his fifth number five, uh, black belt. Um, but it may well be that I was uh, actually his eighth uh, black belt. But in any event, I was in the first 10 uh, of his black belts. So he uh, wanted to promote Ed Parker Sr., we're talking about, wanted to promote Kempo Karate to the world. And in 1967, that was his first well, actually, I'm sorry. Let me retract my statement. 1964 was the very first Long Beach Internationals. What was the idea behind the Long Beach International Tournament? And I know you specifically were involved with creating the rules of that tournament. So, again, Ed Parker had to put full faith in you to do that because that was his name. That was his brand. That was his style of martial arts being introduced to the first time to the world. Yeah, I, the um, uh, it actually started in 1963. I had a call from Ed Parker, and he said, "Come on over." He said, uh, "I I want to show you something." So I drove the 20 miles uh, over to the, the school, and he said, "Come with me." Got in his car. Off we go, and we end up in uh, Bellflower, I believe it was, at Chuck Sullivan's house. And here come Chuck out, and he. He gets in the car and off we go again. And Chuck is looking at me going, what? And I'm going, I don't know, you know. So anyhow, we ended up at the Long Beach um, Auditorium. And we're standing out there in the middle of this auditorium and Ed Parker said, this is where next year we're gonna hold the first international karate championships. And we did. Uh, it was an amazing, uh, the smartest move that Ed Parker ever made was that tournament. Because we would have 5,000 competitors. I mean, uh, the rings would run from like 9 in the morning till 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, 20 rings going full bore. Uh, it was it was just an incredible sight, and all styles were present 
you know, at the, uh, at the internationals. And that's where Bruce Lee uh, did his, uh, his first demonstration, you know, with the one inch punch, boom. And um, uh, was, uh, there was a, um, a producer in the audience who saw uh, Bruce's demonstration. And uh, as a result of that, um, uh, Ed Parker arranged for them to meet, I believe. And um, the producer ended up giving um, Bruce his, uh, his first start as an actor as um, Cato in the Green Hornet. That's how it, that's how it happened. And yeah, I wrote the rules. So, <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, when someone says historically, you actually had an indirect hand in Bruce Lee landing the roles Cato and the Green Hornet. Like, what's your response to that? Uh, yeah, very little though. Uh, I did um, mm -hmm. um, prior to the tournament. Uh, Bruce used to come. Uh, uh, he stayed with Ed Parker, actually lit, literally lived in his house. So Bruce used to come over to the uh, school where we were working out, the Pasadena school, uh, along with Ed. And Ed would, uh, you know, go in his office and do whatever business he was doing. And uh, Bruce would uh, watch our workouts. And um, we got uh, we got through with one workout, and Bruce is standing there. And Bruce said, uh, "Yeah, Chuck Sullivan and I." And he, he said, uh, "He said something about the our, our stuff being uh, not very good stuff." And I kind of took it uh, initially. I took it as a uh, what? I are you are you actually disrespecting the stuff that we're doing? But I, uh, my instant response was wrong. Uh, as he explained, he had a different viewpoint about the actual material. So we started a discussion about the material and uh, this move, that move, you know, how about this move? And we're going here and we're demonstrating the moves on each other. This is a, this is a second meeting where I say, man, Chuck wasn't there at this particular time. And um, the next thing we know, we're, uh, babe, you know, he's throwing a punches and I'm doing stuff and I'm throwing stuff and he, he's throwing them, you know, I mean, just back and forth. Uh, and, and we're literally sparring. But we're sparring in a funny way, in a friend way. We're just enjoying what it is that we're doing. Two guys having fun, beating the crap out of each other. And that basically you know, was it. Of course, I talked to him at the internationals uh, and um, just friendly, really. So. Mm -hmm. Guys, believe it or not, that's our hour. So anything you want to say at the end, Dave, to, to your audience? Um, yeah, I just want to say thank you for taking the time uh, to listen to this old man uh, shoot his mouth <laughs> off, <laughs> I appreciate it. I hope you, uh, I hope you enjoyed um, what I had to say as much as I enjoy saying it. So I hope, uh, I hope I'll see you all next week, same time, same channel. And I hope uh, if you liked it. You'll tell all your friends and have them uh, have them uh, have them join you and watch this show. Thank you.